you to a uh, round of applause again to the two formidable debaters. So we have no conclusion. One had extra time, one had lesser time. Sorry, Dr. Muffitz. <laughs> okay, uh, to move on to the next symposium. Uh, pain blocks for the regional anesthetist. Uh, our chairperson, Dr. Ahmad Afifi, who is an anesthetist and a pain specialist in Hospital Sutana Bahia, also a member of the Special Interest Group of Regional Anesthesia, SIGRA. Uh, warm applause, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andy. Uh, while our first presenter is preparing his uh, talk, uh, let me first introduce him. He is a good friend of mine, Dr. Ku Eng Lee. I have known Eng Lee for a couple of years now. We've been working together in pain uh, management. Uh, he hails from Ipoh and uh, he's been uh, working in Selayang Hospital for pain management and uh, uh, completed his uh, training in Pitamac, uh, Melbourne for one year. And he is now the man handling pain management and palliative care in Institute Cancer Negara, the National Cancer Institute in Putrajaya. So his talk would be on blocks, uh, chronic pain and regional anesthesia. What can we do? What can we help? Please, go. Okay, uh, hi, uh, good afternoon or good evening. Uh, I'm so sorry to talk about chronic pain. I know most of you won't like to hear about chronic pain. When you hear about chronic pain, like, are you chronic pain again? So, uh, but I'll promise you this talk is not about the technicality of blocks or, you know, all this number heavy stuff. It's just more about, you know, what can we do? How can we think out, out of the box to help patients with uh, difficult pain control? All right. So, uh, this is National Cancer Institute. Uh, it's predominantly an oncological hospital. If you do have uh, patients undergoing uh, radiotherapy, chemotherapy. Uh, but uh, recently, we have... Uh, the uh, gynae oncology service coming in, uh, the uh, breast and endocrine surgeons come in f uh, from uh, the from our sister hospital, which is the Hospital Prajaya. All right. So what am I going to talk about today? So this is just my outline of, of my talk. To be quick, all right. I'll try to be fast. So first, I'll just in a brief introduction of what is what chronic pain is all about. Secondly, I'll just talk about how regional anesthesia and anesthesia in help in intractable cancer pain managing acute pain in chronic pain patients, managing pain for wound dressing and preventing how can regional, and, uh, regional anesthesia or analgesia prevents uh, chronic pain. So I'll spend more time on the first two topics because uh, I think I have patients that we can, I can talk about. So according to the ISP, this is the definition of pain. Uh, but as we look at the definition here, there's always a caveat to it. Uh, if you look at it, look at it. There's always uh, actual or potential uh, tissue damage. All right. So in this is more for acute pain. But when you talk about chronic pain, there may not be any uh, damage ongoing. All right. You may not understand what I'm telling. Later, I'll just go on. Okay. So when you, when you classify, how do we class, classify pain? So not all pains are the same. So we should ask how long. So three months, more or more than three months chronic pain. Let's say three months subacute pain. Maybe may, maybe. First two weeks is we still under the acute phase, and what's the cause and what's the pain mechanism? So, like I said, acute versus chronic. Acute, acute is pain of recent on, onset. Chronic is pain persisting beyond healing of injury. Sometimes we don't believe the patient has having pain, although they say they're having pain because when 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 you look at the X-rays, we look at the scans, everything is fine, everything has healed. So, if you look at the spectrum of pain here, so acute pain. When you have acute pain, when you have an, an injury, when you go for a surgery, when you have the tissue damage, healing takes place, the pain goes away. But when you talk about chronic pain, the onset can be insidious. We don't know actually, we don't know actually what happened and when it happens. So acute pain can be post-surgical, can be post-trauma, or it can be can cancer. So but when you talk about pain here, do not forget that pain is just a physical manifestation. In chronic pain, there's always a total pain concept here, which is coined by the uh, palliative care unit. There's also psychological, psychological, social, and spiritual component to it. Never forget this because this is how, uh, you know, sometimes when they present to you, they will present differently. So chronic pain as a whole is 30% of the population in the, in the Western population. So management has to be multidisciplinary. So we can, I mean, well, pain specialists can just do an assessment, medication, behavioral therapy, or any sort of injection intervention. But also we have to take into account we need the physiotherapists and the occupational therapists to come in. 
to improve the exercise and we improve their function. So, in chronic pain management or in any, even in acute pain management, when we provide pain relief, it has to translate to functional improvement. I mean, if no point if we give them a good pain relief, but they are lying down on, on the bed and doing nothing. So if we can provide pain relief and they can show that they can improve their function, even for acute pain, I think that's the thing that we should aim for. Okay, next about, I'm just going to talk about uh, how can regional energies help in intractable cancer pain. I'll illustrate it with a case that we recently have. It's a Mr. CCW is a 60-year-old gentleman. She has a CA prostate with bone mats. Bone scan shows the cancer has mats everywhere, everywhere, but we should look at his symptoms, so where he complains of pain most. So mainly he has a right hip and upper, sorry, upper femur, not, 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 not hip, sorry, right hip and upper femur and left on the chest wall because of the multiple mats at the left side of the chest, the ribs. So he was started on uh, you know, morphine, the usual thing, gabapentin. On, you know, even on high dose, the pain is not well controlled. So of course, he's, he's, he's been already managed by a multi D team. So what next? What can we do next for him? So this is sort of patient that nearing their, nearing the end of life really, when they call upon us to deliver we try our best to deliver and we, we must deliver to help them to have a quality uh, life. So cancer pain pre prevalence is more than 50% and a fraction of them may not respond well to standard treatment and additional options are needed. All right. So this is the modified WHO energetic, energetic leader. I know it's one, two, three that you learn. So number three where you have a severe pain, you use strong opiate. But what happens if strong opiate doesn't work? What options do we have? That's where we can think of uh, any sort of intervention to block the nerves. And this is at the step four, where we, have, we can do intervention for cancer pain. So you consider intervention when unacceptable side effects despite successful analgesia with systemic opioids. Means the patient is getting a lot of sedation, the patient is sleeping the whole day, despite his pain is under control. Think of intervention or the medication is just not effective at all. So what are the evidence for intervention in cancer pain? So if you look at the celiopexis is well, celiopexis block is well described in cancer of pancreas, and intratical or spinal analgesia is one that we always use. All right? And this one interesting about them, about these two uh, interventions is it actually improves survival. So does, does it mean that this uh, intervention actually has, uh, you know, it's like a chemotherapy therapy that sort of like, uh, you know, retard the uh, cancer growth? No, yes. No, actually no, because if you look at it another way, if we provide good pain relief without the uh, side effect of opioids, I mean, when we, we're not zonking them out with a morphine of 100 mg BD, they can breathe better, less respiratory depression, they can function better, of course, they can live longer. Or of course, uh, she was in Slayang Hospital. A uh, spinal catheter was inserted. The cocktail was initiated. So here is nothing that we can use. Is use an ultrasound guidance to choose where do we want to put the catheter. Because as you see from the previous slides, he has mats all over the spine. So we don't want to be doing under landmark tanning and hitting all any of the uh, any of the tumor. So, and of course, you, you reduce the number of attempts. So, if you have seen a cancer patient before who is in a lot of pain, it's not easy to position them in a lateral position or even a sitting position. They can't tolerate it. So, you've got to do it quick, fast, and furious. Sorry, not furious, just quick and fast. <laughs> All right, so following the, the, the insertion, the pain in the right hip was well controlled, right? And we hope that, you know, at L3, L4, we put it at L3, L4, and then uh, we hope that the local will spread all the way up to the uh, thoracic level for the chest pain, right? This is just wishful thinking. Of course, he didn't spread away and he was still having pain. You know, he said, oh, my hip pain is well under control now and, you know, my chest pain is still there. You know, I said, oh, why are, you, why are you not happy with this? Oh, because I still have chest pain. So again, we need to think of things that, how can we help him? But he's already planned for radiotherapy to right femur lesion and lesion around the left ribs. But uh, what can you do in the meantime? Every night he's groaning in pain, he's moaning in pain, he won't sit up. Every time you see him, he complains to you. 
and uh, your and my MO to go and see. Oh, Doctor, I don't want to see him anymore because he's in pain. I don't know what to do with him. So what 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 are the options we can have? Number one, we can just wait and leave it, right? Wait and leave it. Wait for the uh, renal therapy to to take place. Or we can offer him uh, probably intercostal nerve blocks, multiple level block, T1, T2, T3, T4, all the way down 12 injections. Or maybe thoracic para vertebral block, maybe at one level and see whether it spreads and see whether it spread eight segments or, or two segments. Using ultrasound, because with ultrasound, we can see actually where the spreads up. We can see, we can inject at one level and we trace up to the next level, see how well the local anesthetic spreads. So what we, what we did, did was uh, we, we tried a L T4 thoracic paravertebral block. So we scanned at T4 level and and good enough when, when it was the first five mil went in, the spread was good. It, it all spread at least to T2 and T6 and we kept on injecting uh, a total of uh, 10 mils first. Then we put a catheter in and the rest of five mils just to, so to make sure that the catheter is in place and it's not in the epidural space or, or in a in radical space. So the post procedure, the pain reduced for eight or nine to two to three, and it provide to provide good pain relief. And the oncologist actually told me confidently that you know with the radiotherapy within five days the pain will go away. So with this, then we think that okay. So the paravertebral block is just for temporary. Go for the radiotherapy, the pain will go. And after five days, when the radiotherapy kick in, we can take off the paravertebral block and he can go home. Right? Simple. This is the plan. <laughs> But, uh, you know, not everything is, uh, goes on to plan. Of course, he went to radiotherapy. The, uh, even with the radiotherapy, the pain didn't go away, the chest pain. So, we left the catheter in actually for three weeks and it provided pain relief. I mean, we need to adjust the infusion rate there and then and, and, and he passed away about three weeks later. All right? Just thinking out of the box, how can regional, I mean, we're talking about how regional anesthesia can use for, you know, anesthetic patient for, uh, breast surgery, for hip surgery, head surgery. For this group of patients, can we think of, think of the box to help them? All right. So let's say, this, let's say uh, this, this, this is a real patient, a lady, a girl with a tumor of the left, of, of her right hand. And he's supposed to, he post, she's supposed to go for radiotherapy, but he, she can't open her right fist because it's just too painful. Can we just do a catheter technique so that we don't, so that she can open the right hand and she can have the real therapy. It's something we should think of. And like I said, let's say she's going to have radio therapy before that. Should we just do a block first while waiting for the effect to take, take place? And maybe providing pain relief as part of an end-of-life care. And of course, if you're thinking of you know, doing a neurolysis procedure before and to, to see whether it helps with the pain, we need like a diagnostic block first. Like, you know, for shoulder pain, we can always try to do block the uh, supra scapular nerve. It works, then we can always use a phenol injection to, uh, high, uh, to neuralize the pain or even do a radio frequency ablation of the nerve. But invariably, in this sort of chronic pain patients, we will need a catheter. All right, and I think in the next session, uh, uh, Dr. Ng is going to talk more about how we put in catheter, how do we secure it, the technicality of it. So, I mean, I'm, I've searched through the uh, internet and I found this case report actually. They do a tap block with phenol. It's just a one case report, so I'm not sure whether they, uh, how safe it is injecting phenol into the tap place, but actually the patient survived and it provides good pain relief. Right. So, I may move on to the next thing. How managing acute pain in a chronic pain patient. All right. So, I'm sure that, like I said before, there are 30% chronic pain patient moving around in the Western, uh, Western country. So, I mean, in Malaysia, I think these numbers is going to go up. So, it's going to come to you for surgery. And if you, do, if you are not careful, then we're going to have trouble managing their pain. So this is a 26-year-old gentleman. He has a cross injury of the right foot with full fracture of right femur. So, right BKA done. During, during, that, during, that, first, during that time, the pain control was difficult. He has history of alpha-alpha disectomy, epidural attempted, but difficult to pass through the catheter. So after that, you know, he was discharged, but he developed chronic neuropathic stump pain. So it's under pain clinic control, and we managed to control his pain with gabapentin and uh, CBT. I mean, cognitive behavior therapy. So the right femur is non-union despite the, the plating. 
So you should have spent for iliac bone graft. So you went for the surgery without telling anyone. And the anesthetist in charge just did a regular GA, you know, normal 100 mic of fentanyl with 6 mg of morphine. And post off, he had severe pain at the, both the surgical site and the thumb site. So the thumb is which having a neuropathic pain, is having more pain than the, the surgical site pain. And he needed ketamine infusion in addition to the strong opiate that he was having. So if you see the thumb here, he's not contracting his muscle voluntarily. Can you see the fasciculation? So this is just happened spontaneously. So I'm not sure what it is. I mean, I've sent this video to a lot of rehab physicians. They don't know what it is, but she's having a lot of pain from that. Uh, neuropathic pain over, over this lateral aspect of the uh, stump here. All right, a lot of fasciculation. Maybe it's due to sensor sen sensitization because after the surgery, the pain pathway just go haywire. So we push him to the OT, you know, maybe you can see whether there's any neuroma there. There was no new neuroma. There's just a uh, nerve branching. You can see the tibial nerve and the common peripheral nerve, both trace and ended posterior to the knee joint. So we injected around the nerve. And after it was actually a peroneal nerve that the pain disappeared and the fascicle stopped. But you need, as usual, it only lasted for 48 hours, but his pain was less and he, was, he agrees to go home after that. So I, I thought that you know, our problem was over because he went for surgery and he just go to pain clinic and everything is done. He managed to have an education. But then, Again, the orthopedic team is, you know, they like to do stuff. <laughs> so they plan for, they keep even more, become more ambitious. So they want to remove the plate now because the femur is not, they want to do a retrograde nail over the right femur. And they want to remodel the BK stump. They want to cut off some of the bone of the stump and reconstruct the flap again. Can you imagine the pain she's going to have? And we difficult to put an epidural, how are we going to manage this kind of patient? How are we going to manage the pain? So we should consider whether he's opiate tolerant because he's, he's, he's been on tramadol for a long time. How do you assess his pain? He's going to tell you his pain score is 4 or 5 all the time. It's not going to be 0, but it's a 4 or 5. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay, 4 or 5. And is there any pre-existing central sensation we're going to look at? So how do we reduce this? How are we going to reduce this you know, going for the surgery? Okay, he's, let's say there's a patient coming to you now. All right? I, I know most of us think, oh, never mind, I just give a regular GA post-op, you know, the, the, the pain team, the APS team will handle it. Uh, it's not my problem anymore. Bye-bye, <laughs> you know. I go home and off my phone, right? <laughs> so we got to use, the focus mention is to use effective analgesia. All right? Means, effective means not too much, not too little, just right. Use of strategies that will attenuate tolerance or opioid-induced hypertension. We cannot give too much opioid. If give too much opioid, he'll get opioid-induced hypertension. If he's on long-term opioid, we've got to prevent his withdrawal. But we must always have close liaison with all the team because it's always a multi deem disciplinary uh, treatment of patients with chronic pain. So you've got to look at the pharmaceutical, non-pharmaceutical treatment. And in the center here, there's always a multimodal analgesia. When we, you know, when we go for exam, it's always multi. How do you treat this pain? It's multimodal analgesia. So, so regional analgesia here is like fitting into the puzzle nicely. All right. So how will you analyze? He can't have he can't have an epidural because he can have a single shot spinal. But the epidural we tried before, it couldn't go in. Just couldn't go in because he has a previous dis dis uh, disectomy. So what we did was. So perioperatively, we see him in the NS clinic. We started his gabapentin. He was he was he offered himself because he thinking that he, he could manage. Uh, but we explained to him, we discussed with him about his expectation, what he expect, what to what for him to what what medication we give, what block we give him, and what to expect out of this the uh, surgery. So of course, it has to be done under GA. So we pre we did a fascia iliac club block. Although I know that. Uh, Doctor Victor Chi doesn't believe in a uh, fascia iliac club, but this is a retro again. Your link, I think it. It, 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 it helps, I think. <laughs> okay, and also a sciatic nerve block, which is, I think is the most important here, given that, you know, previously he had a sciatic nerve block and it works for his fasciculation. And now they're going to they're, they're gonna cut his tibia again and they're going to do a flat. Oh. So, but we know that he will need a catheter because he will be in pain for the next three or four days. But of course, the surgeon said, oh, your catheter is in my surgical field. Please remove, remove it, all that kind of thing. So, okay, fine, all right. So, but, so we plan to put the catheter after the surgery, but we did give a, a, a single injection first. So with this, and of course, we give him some ketamine infusion, fentanyl bolus, because ketamine is to reduce the uh, opioid uh, tolerance, you know. Kind of thing. 
and morphine only during wound closure. So post-operative, he was fine. The catheter running, running at five minutes per hour. On top of that, ketamine infusion, and he has a PCA morphine. So he has everything in the world, except COX-2. Why? Because he has asthma, and he's, before that, he has a brain person before. So he can't have a COX-2. -COX so the patient pain was well con controlled, and above was we off one by one, and was discharged by gabapentin and uh, tramadol. So this is just one of the instances where the patient comes to you, you to screen them whether they have chronic pain. If they have chronic pain, you've got to be really careful and you've got to offer them multimodal analgesia. And I think regional and analgesia is one of the uh, things that we should offer to, the, to them on top of the whole uh, armamentarium of ketamine, uh, opioid, and also uh, COX-2. Right. right, third, so managing pain for wound dressing. So it's just 20 minutes, right? I have started. <laughs> so it's, it's, I'm going to very quick, just five minutes. So this is just one, this is a 13 year old boy with poon wound, poon wound healing because there's a wound there. I tried to search for any evidence in the literature, but I couldn't find anybody that uses a catheter for a wound, wound dressing. So difficult wound care because, uh, you know, it's the 13 year old boy. They tried to dress him, couldn't dress him. So we did a cytic filter with a patient control with a baseline, and she's, he's more cooperative, able to do resting, and he's, after that he could walk in the ward. This is a mobile uh, PCR machine, Cat Legacy. Okay. Even for chronic leg ulcer, this lady has a chronic leg ulcer because of the anti lipid syndrome, and she was comfortable after that. So, so I wouldn't, so region answer for wound resting. All right, sorry. So the, the, the idea is you provide good pain relief, you can do effective dressing, you can get good healing, or you block the symptomatic blockade, you get the vasodilatation, better blood flow, you get wound healing. Right? That's the idea. Okay. So next, this, this is my last thing I'm talking about. How can regional en analgesia prevent chronic pain? So as you see there, the incidence of chronic pain is, is really high, especially amputation is about up to 80, 85%. So they have, these are the previous various risk factors, but the most important is one of them is uh, inadequate analgesia techniques. So we need to provide good analgesia technique in order to prevent chronic pain post-surgery. So the good evidence here from this met, uh, method and analysis here is uh, four. Let me go here. This is a le level of evidence, sorry. Thoracic epidural analgesia for thoracotomy and power of the block for breast. This is all level one evidence. Okay, this is good. Level three evidence is just spinal for seizure and seizure delivery. And for severe phantom pain spore, it's perioperative epidural analgesia, but it's only level three evidence. So no strong evidence yet for peripheral and trunkal blocks, but I think it's something that we can go look, look into. We can do stu studies and see whether there's any sort of uh, you know, evidence for uh, preventing chronic pain. So in summary, okay, I'm finishing. <laughs> So this is what I've talked about today. So for, can, for can, cancer pain, it's a step four of the WHO ladder. All right. So managing acute pain in a chronic pain patient, remember, has to be per, uh, multidisciplinary and has to be a multimodal, which is the region of the cell fits nicely into here. And for wound dressing, of course, if you can provide good pain relief, effect, effective dressing, vasodilatation, better blood flow with healing. And to prevent chronic Pain, the good level one evidence so far is for thoracic epidural and analgesia for thoracotomy and paravital block for breast surgery. So with that, uh, I've end my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kwe and Lee. Um, any questions from the floor uh, while waiting for Dr. Pankaj Kudra?